And now, Understanding the Times with Jan Markell, the program committed to helping you contend for the faith and view current events through the lens of the Bible. Here's Jan Markell. Yes, it's getting curiouser and curiouser. Where did I hear that? I think that was when somebody fell down into Alice's Wonderland, and sometimes I think that's where I'm living today. Sometimes I think I need about a six-hour program to cover all the events of the day. But this particular hour, we're heading into apologetics. And believe me, I get no joy in reporting and clarifying and telling the inconvenient truth when it comes to false theology. But I have to, uh, well, let's just say this. I have to be true to the calling, and I'm trying to make all of you watchmen on the wall and contenders for the faith. And the only way I can do that is to present to you what is true and what is false. Now, are you aware that there is a movement today among evangelicals that says certain people can get saved without Jesus or certain people can find eternal life apart from Jesus, Uh, that God deals differently with some people when it comes to salvation. Well, we're all aware of the false teaching that would promote this, and there's several, and of course one would be universalism, but but what I, and that is not in the world of evangelicals, but we're, what we're going to talk about today is the Bible teaches this nowhere that you can find eternal life apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, just the opposite. It says that all will stand before him someday as he is the only way, and he will say so. And the Bible says that in numerous places. We'll try to cite those Shortly. Now, here's the theology. Here's what it's called. It's usually called dual covenant theology. And to keep things on a fairly, well, let's just say a simple level here, there are two covenants according to some. This is where we're starting to run into the false teaching. There are two covenants. Well, there really aren't. Gentiles must come to faith through Jesus, but... Jews are automatically saved through a covenant with, well, Moses, Abraham, and so forth. And even if this is not a topic of great interest to you, just the fact that such outrageous theology abounds and is now embraced by some evangelicals should cause you to listen up. Now, we're going to name names today. You need to know who's leading the flock astray. In this particular regard, so unfortunately, again today, we do tell the inconvenient truth. Now, I um, want to bring on air uh, the guest I have in studio with me. Let me just conclude my, my sort of very short here introduction by stating that this theology basically says the bottom line would be only Gentiles need to be reborn. The roots go back almost a 100 years. We're going to dispense with history today just because of the time. Uh, but it, what, it did pick up steam in the 1970s. So that's where we're going to begin our discussion about dual covenant theology when it started to become popular in the 1970s. One who has studied this very carefully and has made a presentation on it that I highly recommend, we'll talk about contact information in just a moment, is the assistant pastor at Twin City Fellowship Church here in a suburb of Minneapolis. His name is Carl Johnson. So, Carl, welcome to Understanding the Times. Thank you, Jen. It's nice to be with you. Now, you did, as I said, you did a presentation on this, which um, at your a monthly Bless Israel meeting that you have at uh, Twin City Fellowship. And as I listened by way of CD, the movement picked up steam in the 1970s, but that was hugely mainline Protestant. Would that be true? Yeah, that's correct. Um, we see really this movement really takes um, strong uh, root after World War II, and certainly by the 1970s it has developed. All right, so the mainline Protestants were getting into it in the 1970s. They, well, they just suddenly start to get interested in the fact that did something spur them on? I think there were four factors that we see that led to mm-hmm. the acceptance of this type of teaching. If I can very quickly give you what those four are. First of all, I think as uh, 
direct result of the tragedy of the Holocaust, do you see kind of a collective guilt from mm-hmm. the Protestant churches in Europe, which really carry over into America, and uh, and they really see that evangelism now is is almost another step in Hitler's final solution. So so this idea of evangelism is something that they just totally totally stay away from. This is mainline Protestants. Mainline Protestants. A second factor is this idea of dialoguing. We see mm-hmm. that picking up in the 60s, where let's share about our commonalities, let's mm-hmm. not touch upon our differences, and uh, we'll just kind of link arms and. Uh, celebrate those commonalities. The third one, and I see this is an area that even evangelicals really get yeah, into. Yeah, and we're is going the, there next. Okay, but, is the but, support of Israel, mm-hmm. and uh, obviously that can lead to compromises within the community. And then lastly, one that you've already touched on is just bad theology, mm-hmm. misunderstanding the scripture and misapplying them. All right. All right. I had those in my notes, and uh, we have now covered them, and that's just fine, because we're going to head now into the 1980s, because and, and, and let's just go back and say that mainline Protestants in the United Methodist Church, or the Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church, there are many good people in these denominations that would never go along with what we're talking about. I never broad brush any denomination. That's right. Uh, so we're not we're not trying to do that here. Many in these denominations listening may be shocked even to hear this. But now we're moving into the 80s because that's when evangelicals began to get interested in this so-called dual covenant theology. Yes. And again, folks, that's saying... In a simple definition here, Gentiles get saved one way. They need to be reborn. Jews do not need to be reborn. They have a special covenant through Moses, Abraham, and so forth. So in the 80s, we have the movement catching on primarily because of one man. Now, folks, we're telling the inconvenient truth today. I know you're going to be mad at Carl and I. And we don't, we're not touching on this particular individual to, um, in any way to be divisive, to be harsh. We're just telling you the truth. And you can do with it what you choose. Uh, we're not telling you to stop following this individual, but we are throwing out a red flag, which should have on the red flag buyer beware. Because it's very hard for us to talk about dual covenant theology without bringing into the equation the name of John Hagee. He is the primary evangelical promoter that Jews do not need Jesus for salvation. And he has been confronted on it endlessly by solid evangelicals. And when he's confronted, he will deny that he believes that. But he does and he continues to teach it. I have a quote here from the Houston Chronicle in the late 80s. He says, I'm not going to convert the Jewish people to Christianity. In fact, trying to convert them is a waste of time. No form of evangelism has failed so miserably. All other people must believe in Jesus, but not the Jews. The Jews already have a covenant with God, and they don't need Christianity. Yes, certainly we see John Hagee as being the major force within the evangelical movement, and and I suppose you could consider John as a flip-flopper in this area because he'll make a statement and then he'll retract it, and and you see over a period of time him going back and forth. And, And this again, Jan, getting back to our point earlier, when you try to walk the fine line between the evangelical community and the Jewish community, you inevitably end up compromising, yeah. and we see John doing that over and over again. 